Joining me now is Juana Matias. Uh, she's running Massachusetts third district. Uh, she's a just Democrat. That means she's uncorrupted and very progressive. Uh, welcome to Rebel Headquarters. Thank you so much for having me on. It's such a pleasure. Uh, no problem. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. So let's talk about your district. Um, uh, sometimes just Democrats run in, in deeply red districts and uh, and then they've got a challenge in, in not just the primaries but the general election. In your case, uh, this is a Democratic district. So can you tell us a little bit more about it? How Democratic is it and why is it an open seat? It's a pretty Democratic district. Uh, Congresswoman Nikki Sangas, who currently holds the seat, decided not to run for re-election. So it's a vacant seat. There are 10 candidates running. Um, it's been a Democratic district for decades. However, there is a Republican and two unenrolled uh, candidates that will be part of the general uh, race. Uh, I think so long as the Democratic nominee after September 4th continues to engage with voters, it should be a safe Democratic seat. However, when I talk to people, I think that sometimes we take for granted. It's not just about being a Democrat, it's about being a progressive, bold leader, someone who's really gonna give a voice to working class families who are struggling to get by. Uh, so this is an exciting race. I am currently a state representative in the district. I represent the community of Lawrence, which happens to be the second largest in the congressional district, largely immigrant, um, largely from the Dominican Republic and uh, Puerto Rico. And we are six days away from this election and we're talking to voters every single day. We build a grassroots campaign, small uh, dollar contributions. We're talking to voters day in and day out to ensure that they know that this election is happening after the day, uh, after Labor Day. So the primary likely it will decide who the next congressperson from that district is. So that, 100%. yeah, so that's why the primary is so important. And like you said, there are 10 Democrats. We in fact interviewed uh, someone else from that race as well. So, Representative Mateus, what would be your argument for why it should be you, not just as opposed to the corporate Democrats, but as opposed to all the people in the race? Yeah, no, I think it's a question we're getting a lot in these last couple of days. And I, I, I like to point to two things as to what makes me very different from all of the other candidates that are in this race. First of all, I didn't make this district my home because of political ambitions. I arrived to this country at the age of five from the Dominican Republic and my family settled in Haverhill, Massachusetts, which is part of the third congressional district. It happens to be the third biggest community. And I saw my parents work blue collar factory jobs their entire lives, um, earning minimum wages. This gave me the opportunity to go on to college and law school. And when I finished my studies, I came back to the district to be of service. I was a social worker after my UMass Boston days and then went on to law school and actually completed my second national service year as an AmeriCorps and I was defending children who had recently crossed the border, uh, predominantly doing a refugee and asylum work uh, at a legal aid agency as a Justice AmeriCorps advocate. And then went on to challenge an anti-choice, anti-LGBTQ Democratic incumbent who had been entrenched in our community for many years. And I you know, decided that I didn't want to sit at the sidelines while I continued to see a community that had the highest unemployment rate, had lost control of, a pub, of its public schools uh, and uh, you know, was just, facing a lot of challenges and barriers. So ran for office and everyone told me that it was impossible, that I was not gonna win. And we talked to voters day in and day out and became the first Latina immigrant ever elected to the Massachusetts State House and have been advocating on so many issues. So for me, you know, I didn't move into like the district like some of these candidates have because of this vacancy. I've been here in this district making a difference, impacting people's lives for the better. And um, you know, I think it speaks a lot to what we need in Congress at the federal level, at the state level, as servant leaders. Yeah. People who don't, don't talk about public service, but people who can demonstrate it with their track record. You know, I'm proud to have the endorsement of Justice Democrats and also New Politics, which is an organization that endorses candidates that have demonstrated a track record of service. You have to be a veteran, a Peace Corps member, or a Justice or AmeriCorps member. And so that's how I was able to obtain their, their endorsement. And then the second point would be that I think the Democratic Party for years has talked about being the party of the working class. And yet we elect people who have no idea what that actually means. And I've seen it in my race, people who have moved into the district who have raised millions of dollars. And you know you have organizations that then you meet with and they ask you questions of viability. And that means how much money can you raise? It shouldn't be about how much money you can raise. It should be about what you want to do for a district, what your ideas are, what's your commitment to public service. And so you know I think that I am a working class candidate that saw my parents work minimum wage jobs. I have over $150,000 worth of student debt. When my father in 2014 was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, I recall being on the phone for hours 
kind of trying to make sure that his treatment was covered. So a lot of these working class issues, I've lived them. They've made me who I am. And if given the opportunity to represent this district, I will make sure that I'm a champion and a tireless voice for working class families and making sure that we're putting people before politics. Earlier, you said that you helped represent kids that had crossed the border. But I mean, that's not really in the news and wouldn't be relevant if you were in Congress, would it? I mean, it is very relevant. <laughs> and I, sometimes I ask myself, it's like, I was not thinking about running for Congress. I'm a young Latina woman of color, uh, do not come from a wealthy background. And when I was contemplating putting my name on the ballot for this position, uh, the biggest barrier I saw was money. And then I saw everything that was playing out with the Muslim ban, the travel ban, all of these things that implicated, you know, my story and the people that I represent in my district, and just felt that, you know, the timing was perfect. Um, and it's been very disappointing, you know, being here at the state legislature in Massachusetts and seeing us not speak up, uh, not stand for our values. I've been leading on a bill called the Safe Communities Act, and it does a couple of things. It prohibits law enforcement officials from racially profiling and asking you about your legal status. It prohibits 287 agreements, and that's when your local sheriff departments can deputize offers officers to be ICE agents. And Massachusetts had an opportunity to say, we've seen a divisive racist president in this country. Uh, and we are going to ensure that immigrants in Massachusetts under, uh, understand that we uh, want them to live with safety and with dignity and that they can feel comfortable calling their law enforcement. And we failed to do so. And this is where I bring the point up. It's not just about being a Democrat. It's not the Republicans in the Massachusetts State House who did not support this. It was Democrats themselves. And so I think we need bold progressive leaders, unapologetic leaders who understand that you're there to make a difference in the lives of others and address the inequities that exist in both the pu public and private sector. And for me, what drove me to be involved in public service was that, was being in a courtroom and seeing how your race and your economic standing had such huge implications on the outcome of your case. And I wanna ensure that people yeah. in this district really have someone who could speak on their behalf. So one more thing, and I want to give the website to juanamatias.com. We'll have the links down below to also volunteer and donate. When you don't take corporate PAC money, like all the Just Democrats, you really need people to step up and fight for you so they can get in office and return the favor. So how did you beat that incumbent? Because that that that's a really hard thing to do. and. And I'm always fascinated by stories like yours where you really had nothing and were able to defeat uh, part of the machine. Yeah, um, I remember sitting at a library, making a list of the pros and cons of running. Didn't know how I was gonna raise money, had never done this before. And everyone in the establishment in the city of Lawrence, which I represent now, was against me. I met with that, every single one of them. They were just like, no, it's not your turn. You should wait in line. You're too young. I was 28 years of age when I was doing this. and. Um, I had to look within myself and what motivated me was seeing a community that continued to have a lack of representation and advocacy when we had the most need. And um, I just started hitting doors, talking to voters day in and day out. Um, and I would see people sometimes and say, you're not going to local community activities. And I started noticing that it was the same people at those activities, the establishment who didn't support me. And what I did was make sure that the voters who were gonna go out and vote it both knew who I was and that I spoke to them about the issues that I thought, saw that we were facing and how I wanted to resolve them and hit doors for 11 months straight. Everyone thought it was impossible and I, I surprised a lot of people. Uh, and it's been great to really be a voice uh, in the state house for immigration issues, uh, equity issues when it comes to public education, a criminal justice reform. I feel that you know until we get people who are really affected by these things, we're not gonna have the solutions we really need. Okay, and, and if you got into office, what would be your top priority? Uh, my top priority would be um, economic opportunity, ensuring people have access to a living wage. I think it's absurd that people are working 40 hours a week in this country and are living in poverty. I was really proud to uh, cast my vote just a couple of months ago to increase the minimum wage here in Massachusetts to $15. I would be supportive of that at the federal level. Um, one thing that I really care about and that I think we need to do more of is really ensuring that a child's zip code is not determinative of their future. And here in Massachusetts, we get so much credit for being the number one state when it comes to public education. And 60% of students of color, African American and Latino, cannot read at a third grade level. More than half, we have one of the highest and most persistent achievement gaps in the country. And so for me, 
I wouldn't be where I am today had it not been for the education I, I, I received. And I think there are too many communities that are being left behind. And when you talk about economic opportunity, education always needs to be on the table. And it's not just K through 12, it's how do we expand early childhood education? How do you go to college and obtain a degree without having to indebt yourself for life? have over $150,000 worth of debt. And I think we need people in Congress who are talking about tuition-free community colleges and state universities. And we can do this, you know, yeah. we absolutely can do this. It's about electing the people that really believe in these values and are gonna fight on behalf of these things. So that would be my uh, yeah. my top issue. And I also really care about healthcare. My father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2013. And uh, I saw how, how my family had to be on the phone uh, while my father was, you know, facing a terminal illness to try to figure out how we were going to be able to afford the cost. That's no crazy. one in this country in 2018 should have to be facing whether, yes, I have the money to take care of the medical needs I need or to put food on the table. You know, healthcare should be a fundamental right, not a privilege that is given to those who can afford it. All right, Representative Mateus, thank you so much for joining us. Massachusetts third district uh, primary is coming up soon. Uh, thank you for being with us on Rebel Headquarters. Thank you so much, it's such a pleasure. Thanks. Really appreciate the opportunity. Of course. Take care.